Thank you very much, Maike. And um, at first, thank you very much for your very interesting input. I think we will have already a lot of consult for discussion. Um, um, Maike has introduced myself. I'm Ursula Keller from Swiss Development Agency, Senior Gender Policy Advisor, and very glad to moderate um, um, this, this panel. Um, uh, we have 15 years resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security, and there has been a lot of commemoration and reviews take, happening this year. The latest one, some days, 10 days ago in New York, which was the so called high level review. So I think there was a lot of um, talks about what actually has been achieved and where are the gaps. Uh, I think your input gave us a fair impression on what can be achieved, but where are also the, the, the challenges. Um, um, I think it's, you showed in the Philippines, it's, it's not, um, uh, there are women who are involved in peace processes and there are women who are doing peace. So um, we, we are talking a lot about women getting involved. In, in, in peace processes. On policy level, we have a lot of um, commitments. We have tools, we have policies on national level, up to down on local level. But we all, um, all were fully aware that there is more like the glass is more like half, um, still half empty. The, you might either see it as half full or half empty. So, um, uh, what we would like now to on this on this panel actually to look a little bit into what are opportunities for women's participation in peace processes or at the peace table as it is called here and where are where are still the obstacles that we face what is the role of this resolution that some of you knew and some of you not yet and um, which you said actually i'm not sure if it was because of the resolution so maybe we wouldn't have needed this resolution. So let's discuss these, these issues. And I'm, of course, very glad to have these um, very competent um, speakers um, with me. They have been all introduced uh, before, so I'm not taking more time on that. I would like to start, actually, with um, with Sima, Sima Samar. You know her all. She is one of your um, long-term coordinator. And you have lived, um, Afghanistan has lived through wars and conflicts for the past 30 years or more. And you have been living through all these wars and conflicts and always trying to raise the voices of women. Both you have been in government positions, you have been in civil society, you have lived this woman your personal life. So um, I would want to ask you a very fundamental question first. What actually, after all these decades of ongoing co conflicts and violence, what actually means peace for women, for Af from an Afghan women's perspective? Mm -hmm. What means participation of women in peace process in Afghanistan? I think um, one might first has to understand uh, where are the different needs and wishes and dreams, well, what, what is it from your perspective that we're actually talking about? Um, first of all, good afternoon everybody and I'm very happy to see uh, a lot of uh, people in the room and a lot of friends in the room. Uh, I think first of all, um, resolution 1325 is a resolution which is passed by the uh, Security Council on 30th October 2000. And I think it's first time in my view that the United <coughs> Nations, since the establishment of the United Nations, they really realized or recognized or acknowledged the women's existence and women's full meaningful participation in the peace process. 
But as I, uh, as Ursula said, uh, we are at war in Afghanistan since 38 years. So we had the uh, USSR, we had the coup d'etat, then USSR invaded our country, and then we had the Mujahideen government, and we had the Taliban in Canada, and then we had uh, President Karzai and Americans in Afghanistan, and now we have unity government. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have to say that in all these years, particularly the, for the first, let's say, 23 years, women were completely ignored. So women, everybody ignored women. It was not only that the Afghans ignored, but also the international community ignored. I keep telling this story to everyone that um, I remember when we um, we're talking about uh, women's and women's participation, even small project of uh, health for education for women, nobody was interested. I mean, for, for some of the international community, women and Afghan women was out of question. So they were saying that we respect the culture, we respect the religion. But it is not the culture, it's not the religion. It's ignoring half of the population. Uh, not seeing them, not acknowledging their existence. Um, I, I just say, I have to say one, one, uh, one of my experiences. In 1989, when the, uh, the Russian soldier left Afghanistan, then the United Nations decided that they should have a coordination of the uh, funding or development projects in Afghanistan, so that United Nations Development Program, UNDP, came to open an office for the Afghans, but still in Pakistan. It was so interesting because I called and I said that, uh, and I took an appointment and I went to, to see this person. I, I said, I'm so happy that the final United Nations Development Program came and uh, came to, uh, to work for Afghanistan. Do you have any program and projects for women? And he says, uh, no, for women? And I said, yes, for women. Do you think that you can have development if you don't have women in the program or for, for a program for women or involve women on development? He said, when I traveled to Afghanistan and I've been in Lugar, one of the province in Afghanistan, which is very close to Kabul, I haven't seen any woman. <laughs> and I said, uh, very nice. All these heroes who picked out the Russian from Afghanistan are not dropped from the sky. They are born of women. All of them has a mother. And he was shocked because he was not expecting this kind of a reaction. You know all the male domination and, and, at the UN. Then he said, I haven't seen any Afghan woman. So I said, can I be a representative? He said, he looked at me, he said, you're French? And I said, no, I, I have a green eyes, but I'm not French. I am an Afghan, and I am a woman. <laughs> uh, but saying this, that it was really general ignorement or ignorance of women's position. So 1325 for me is the first time that they acknowledge in the level of United Nations Security Council. Mm -hmm. The second question is uh, coming that is it really implementable, applicable, and the people are really taking it seriously? Of course, that's another question. I would say no, because a lot of people doesn't know about it. Number one. Number two, I think it's a lot of People in this country or in other countries or in the US, they don't know about 1325 because this goes, this belongs to the conflict countries. So it, it's our resolution, I would say. Uh, but in Afghanistan, a lot of people doesn't know about it. It's a very small number of women, but the activists do know about it. So we began to, to um, advocate for the implementation of your resolution 1325. And of course, the, the other reason that the, the people does not take it very seriously, it's a res resolution, there's no mechanism to keep the countries accountable for the implementation. There's no mechanism. You do it, you're good. If you don't do it, you're still good. But it depends on the power of the people. 
So we were really advocating for uh, implementation of this resolution because when the government decided to have a, uh, a high peace council. Again, this whole policy of high peace council uh, is another issue in Afghanistan, unfortunately. It came after the visit of the, the president in the US, actually. Sometime when the government really wants to shift the, uh, the people's ideas and opinion to another side, then they will talk about this peace process. Otherwise, they don't really have peace process, honestly. They're not there. They don't have the political commitment. Uh, so then they decided to have a high peace council. Of course, we lobbied for women's participation. We have 69 people as a high peace council. Most of the members of the High Peace Council are contradicting each other. They are part of the conflict. So it's, uh, I mean, usually the people who create the con conflict, they can solve it. But still, there should be people who really for peace. But it's, uh, again, we go back to the uh, definition of peace, what peace means for us, and what do we want from this. Anyway, so the um, Finnish government, the Finnish embassy, uh, began to support this idea. So in, finally in 2011, our, uh, the Finnish embassy with the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they signed an agreement to work on the uh, action plan for the 1325. Um, and while they, we were signing the memorandum of understanding, and I said, it's 10 years from the uh, resolution, and I hope it doesn't take another 10 years for uh, creating action plan and doesn't take another 10 years for the implementation. Anyway, we had finally we had an action plan which was launched in, in June 30. But I think having a lot of good documents is one part of it. Mm -hmm. But the real need, the real impact of that docu um, document is to implement, to make it reality in the ground for every woman who lives in the conflict. Uh, the third question, which is uh, what peace means for us. For me, peace means that I have freedom. Peace means that I have security. Peace means that I have a human security, that I get sick, and there is a hospital to go. Honestly, we don't have that. I, I, I can be counted as one of the high officials in, in Afghanistan. But I'm afraid if I ha get a heart attack in the middle of the night, there's no hospital that I could trust in go. So it's not only to stop the war. It's not only to not hear the, the explosion. It is more than that. It is human security where you think that your daughter can go to school and come back safely. Nobody will break her or kidnapped or on the way from the school. But it doesn't mean that we should not do what we want to do. I mean, I, I, I didn't slogan peace, but I thought that I would begin for, or with provide provision of basic social services to the people, to the need, needy ones, a health service, uh, education, some kind of a training. More, more importantly, some confidence building that women can have the confidence and can say that I am equal person <coughs> to the people in order to bring the process. So I, the, the reason I'm saying that we are very, very far from peace and negotiation to bring them on the table, we have uh, enemies, but I think the governments, our government in Afghanistan or government in, in, in Philippines, they should do a lot of homework first. They should really promote good governance. They should pr provide the basic social services to the people, job opportunity, self-confidence, or uh, respect for human dignity, in order to prepare the ground for a better peace. Otherwise, the peace will not be sustainable. The peace would be easily a ceasefire. Ceasefire is not peace. So, um, but in those, even in those ceasefire, women should have a strong role. And they are half of the population, you can't really ignore them. 
and I stop here. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So it's about making women visible, that was your first step, and then making sure they have security, freedom, can move around and have a say in everything. So I think you very nicely explained that peace is not only about the ceasefire, but it's really about um, having um, your own freedom as a woman, as a citizen, and having a say in it. And you don't see that you're there in Afghanistan, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, sorry. I think ceasefire can be the, the first, first step. Yeah, yeah. So that we should yeah. not completely undermine ceasefire. Yeah. <laughs> because at least uh, when you go out, go out of the house, you don't turn to different pieces and yeah, nobody could find you. So that is the first step for uh, peace, but yeah. peace, peace requires much more work. Yeah. Thank you. Karen, you have maybe uh, described us uh, quite a positive example. I mean, mm -hmm. I've seen on this picture so many women, so I think this is really an example how uh, women, I mean, how you manage to, to participate in such large scale women in all different um, committees. And what also struck me, I mean, that what is interesting in your presentation, we talk about peace table, and then we always have in mind these moments of signing, and we look around, oh, there are no women, but actually you have, I don't know, how many commissions and uh, legal committees and uh, monitoring thing. So the, could you unpack a little bit what means actually a peace process? It seems this is actually a long process <laughs> with many different phases, and women have been participating in different uh, functions in this. So why was it actually so successful in the Philippines and where you see now the challenges and the dangers? Why? Because it's still not implemented. Um, well, there are two peace process, or actually even more, in the Philippines, but one major one on the communists and one on the Bangsamoro that I described. So, successful on the Bangsamoro, and I believe it is because they, they the, the MILF, the major group, <laughs> Uh, listened to their communities and heard that the people wanted peace. Mm -hmm. And that's why they have been negotiating. Uh, although they, they're very firm in their demand for what kind of autonomy, but they really went to the ceasefire because they lis I believe they listened to their communities who wanted peace. The other peace process on the communist side it's not successful. So maybe, um, and even if there are many women there also, there was one peace panel where the chair also was a woman, and she had three members, including Pauline Sika, who was our coordinator. Yes, but, but that still it was not successful because the other party um, was not uh, had certain demands before they go to the table. So it, it's also co quite complex how a group can be ready. And I think other women here can identify there that it's not easy to get to the, the peace table. But then you have, if, if that's the case, then you have to work uh, in the community level, in the civil society, anywhere, if you cannot get to the table. <laughs> Maybe that's all I can share. OK, thank you. Um, Carmela. Um, Switzerland has such a document, National Action Plan 1325, since 2007, and is now in the third mm -hmm. phase, she's showing it, <laughs> very official. And you actually have been the manager, I call it, a little bit, of this um, document for many years now. I mean, you're coordinating it within the Swiss government, all the actions, and you were also following all the developments on international level um, around the resolution 1325, um, as I mentioned before, um, we had just this high-level review. How do you see the overall development? I mean, what was at the beginning um, the meaning and how were governments dealing with it? And how, what, it <coughs> what does this resolution mean now? How did it evolve? And did you manage to mainstream it in um, Swiss peace and security politics? Or what 
could you manage the mainstream and what are the points maybe not? Mm -hmm. So just give us a brief assessment. Okay, thank you. First of all, of course, happy birthday to Peace and the Crossroads. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. It's great to be here. Um, we're talking social change, we're talking actually almost a social revolution when we talk 1325. And I think we have seen that in, in the Philippines very nicely. It takes time. And that's actually a discussion we're having all the time at the ministry as well when we talk about participation of women in mediation processes, in peace processes. Um, it takes time, we need to prepare the path. Our support um, can't just come when, when the agreement is to have to be signed. I mean, I really like that example from the 80s <laughs> and how actually networks are, are consolidated and lead the way. And I think, um, to come back to our policy and to your question, uh, this is one thing we, we try to put emphasis on, the support and the, the support, also financial support, political support of women's networks in these areas, in fragile contexts. Um, very often in, in, in the political directorate, it's talk about track one to track, track three, these different tracks. And of course, um, probably, especially when it comes to women peace and security, it's about a multi-track approach. It's about supporting women in grassroots, in civil society. But then again, it's really also about bringing women up to track one and, and, and bringing women into formal um, peace processes. So I'm also not happy when we hear, um, when I'm confronted with the, with the cliché or, or sometimes it's the response, yes, we're financing, or you might hear, or I have heard, we're financing NGOs, so we're done with our duty in the frame of 1325. No, 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 it's not true. Our biggest challenge is actually to bring women to the peace table and to formal negotiations, as far as numbers are considered, because um, you were talking about the high-level review. Um, the high-level review week in New York, in the Security Council, was taking advantage of the so-called global study. You might have heard about it. The global study was mandated by the Security Council and Secretary General um, of the UN in order to assess progress and, and remaining challenges from the last 15 years. And it's a big, big document of over 300 pages. I'm still reading. And it's really an interesting document to have to when you when you want to get, go deeper into the issue, and it gives us a lot of, of uh, actual um, starting points for further action and recommendations. So basically, during this high level review, we found out that um, we have the glass is half full, so there has been a lot of progress. For example, we think of the ICC statute and how for the first time SGBV, so sexual and uh, gender-based violence, was actually introduced as a war crime in international law. For me, this is still something very important. It was a big thing. It's a real change in, in, in the understanding of what is international criminal law. Um, another progress, just to mention a few of them, is that Nowadays, when we have commissions of inquiry mandated by the uh, Human Rights Council, you have always, in all the commissions right now, you have a gender specialist, or SGBV is part of the mandate. So, on the other hand, uh, according again to this global study, you have 67% of all peace agreements include language on women, peace and security. Now again, of course, we can, we can debate of whether or not um, the language, as we call it in multilateral politics, is afterwards implemented, but it's a starting point. 
then you have more and more also, I like this example of the UN, and, and we heard it twice, like international, so-called international community not doing their own homework. And um, we have more police and, and, and security personnel right now in, in uh, the UN, but it's still very, very few women actually. It's small, it's small yes. Um, now we also find out in this in this uh, in this global study that funding for bilateral projects for gender specific projects has actually risen quadrupled. On the other hand, in the challenge we, challenges we will find that it's still far away from being sufficient. We still have a little it's it's too few projects actually or too few little funds that are invested still in, in, in gender equality issues. Um, I think what is interesting is also in terms of accountability and reporting that we have now the general recommendation 30 of the CEDAW convention um, and that allows us to include in state reports 1325 issues. So there is a sort of accountability mechanism now, there is a sort of, of control through those state reports. Of course, it's again, it's afterwards, it's the state. It's how diligent they report on, on, on how they work. Um, in New York, there was a new topic, of course, because the environment has changed lately. Um, Counterterrorism, as some countries call it, or prevention of uh, violent extremism, how we prefer to call it was a big issue, is a big focus of the new re resolution because we have a new resolution as the result of the high level review and the, and the open debate in the Security Council. This new resolution, it's not too bad actually. Um, of course there is a lot of, uh, a lot of language that some people might consider or is probably a testimony of, of the increased militarization also of our environment. Um, There's a lot of talk about, as I said, prevention of extre extremist violence. But there is also interesting um, par paragraphs on the inclusion of civil society, on the inclusion and the cooperation of civil society with the Security Council. Um, I think that was one of, one of the, the big issues. Now, I haven't talked about Switzerland. <laughs> you managed so. to change government policies. <laughs> yes. Are they more gender sensitive, more women inclusive in peace and security? But I, I would like to highlight one point, namely that I, I'm, I'm a, I think our national action plan, for example, does something that um, I, from the first moment, we wanted to make a, um, a connection to um, our human resources policy in the foreign ministry. And I think. Um, we have to do our own homework first amongst the diplomats and amongst our own staff, and amongst those people that we send out to mediate in conflicts. As we saw, Mo Bleeker is one of our special envoys. She's still among few women that are actually out there in very high positions. But I think there was a, an active policy to promote women in, in, in diplomacy and in, in higher government positions. And if you look at our report, uh, implementation report from the National Action Plan this year that we submitted to the Parliament actually for the first time, um, you will see the, the numbers are encouraging. The numbers are, we're getting better. We started very, at a very low level in Switzerland and we're a little bit slow but we're getting there. Uh, very good progress there. Um, we still have to fight for, for, to get really into higher positions because you find women obviously still more in the mid-management mid and, and lower position, lower salary classes, but we're getting there. Um, have we managed to mainstream? Yes, I think to a certain degree, but it's a constant. We, if you look at the report, we have good and interesting examples. Um, we have good commitments now. We made pledges in New York. Uh, one, one pledge that Switzerland made, for example, was an increase of contributions to UN Women. And we have some other interesting, interesting examples, but I don't want to take too much time here. Um, I think the glasses have full. We continue. Okay, thank you.
And now it's Sidonia. Um, Resolution 1325 was actually an agenda driven by civil society. Um, it was the first time you mentioned it that um, women, peace and security, <laughs> the agenda of women, peace and security got into hard politics. And my impression is now, we just heard Carmela, hmm, how successful um, are and had the commitments of governments. And 15 years later, actually, secure, governments and security actors do actually take it quite serious, this resolution. Um, they have taken on the agenda, including the military, like NATO. They also have partly mainstreamed it. We have many countries, almost 50 countries, who have a so-called national action plan. So, is this a success? Can civil society hand over now? Um, or how do you assess achievements and the gaps from a civil society perspective? What is your role still? Or what does the government maybe do more talk than more doing? So, <laughs> thank you for this for this uh, very good question, Ursula. Um, can civil society hand over now? I don't think so, and I think otherwise we wouldn't be here all today together, because I think we all believe that we have to continue. But the question is rather. Um, to look back, of course, and then also to look at what is then. Maybe we have a shift, maybe we should twist our role a little bit, and maybe we need also to refresh uh, a little bit our thinking around um, these issues. But let me first start with an appreciation of the UN Resolution 1325. I think it has been a success, and I think also that it is a success that now, like government actors, track one actor so-called, are taking it on and I think we should really acknowledge that um, because I think also as civil society we can use the resolution as language. We can, we can take part of it out and say well we are going to implement this and this part and it helps us to do the advocacy. So I think we should, we should not forget that. However, I think we have to be very careful um, with the actors, with the, with the discourse and where the discourse around 1325 and then where implementation is going. Let me maybe start with, with the implementation. What we see from a civil society perspective is, I think also what Sima was mentioning, there is still a very much a gap because civil society 15 years ago wanted to improve the protection of women, the, the feeling of security, life conditions of women in conflict affected areas and wanted to increase participation. So I think actually now we have to go back to these women and say and look at their situation. Has it really improved? And I think there we still see a lot of gaps and I think we have to acknowledge that as well. <coughs> And maybe we have overloaded a little bit the expectations towards what a resolution at a normative level can do, because it all in the end depends on, on the political will, and that's why it is a political work that we have to do, on the social cultural aspects. They were also mentioned, like in Wang Samo, where they were saying, well, we can't, in our culture, we don't negotiate, we don't <laughs> struggle, we don't argue with women, we don't argue with women. Right, so it has this very, very strong social cultural aspect, and it also has, of course, technical capacity aspects. And I think we have been very good at the technical level. You mentioned it, Ursula, that we have the concepts and we have the tools and we have all of these. But I think a challenge for civil society is and will still be to include the political dimension and the social cultural dimension and to continue working on these. So if we look at, for instance, you mentioned the, the, the example of the police. So you would have more women in police forces, but then um, we did a, a small study in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Okay, there are more women maybe in the police force, but what women are telling us, they don't feel more secure because of that. Because the question is the change of very deep-rooted patriarchal uh, uh, systems. So again, I think here, um, the resolution gives us a framework, but of course the challenges in the reality are much more complex than that. And again, I would say the resolution helps us to do that advocacy, uh, but at the same time 
uh, it also has its limit. There are other resolutions, CEDO, there are other instruments also that we can use in a very uh, smart way. Um, maybe. <laughs> oh, my paper. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, I don't. Um, and I think one thing, maybe for the roles of civil um, society, uh, yes. From a Swiss perspective, but also from the work that we have been doing. I mean, we have been in the past year, since 2007, we have been monitoring the Swiss National Action Plan. We have looked at also these gaps in the implementation in, in the local realities, and I think that's a role that we have to continue to play. We have to share these realities, we have to make them visible, we have to bring them to the surface. and. Um, and I think there also from a civil society perspective we can be on a very technical level, we can be a bit more political in the sense that we also create more creative indicators, more qualitative indicators that really show uh, the life conditions of women in these contexts. So that's one thing. I think another role that civil society should continue to play is the role of being a translator. I think translating between this, the grassroots level, the civil society, and then this very um, high level, uh, so to translate the realities of women in these different levels, in these different communities, right? It's, it's sometimes difficult as a grassroots organization who does excellent work to talk. I mean, I, I, I've lived, <laughs> I went through that in, in, in West Africa. To go to a high-level meeting and just to talk and to say things, sometimes it's just also a question of understanding the different realities. And I think when international actors say civil society, civil society, civil society, all the UN reviews that are ongoing, civil society is at the top, and all the, 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 the language also around countering violent terrorism, uh, extremism, civil society is there. Well, the question is, how do we really deal with this kind of diversity? If you have women's organizations, you know very well that there are different perceptions of what is peace, of what is security, of what is a good life condition. So the, to, to really be inclusive and to really integrate and accept this diversity, I still don't believe that these very structured, very bureaucratic actors are, are, are still able to do. And I think there is a role for civil society uh, to, 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 to push for that. And maybe not one last word on uh, countering violent extremism. Um, I think in the past 20 years, I would say the peace building community uh, as a whole has been very much fighting for having different perspectives, bringing different perspectives at the peace tables, at the tables. So also bringing women, of course, um, uh, at the tables. Um, I think when we look at, at, at countering violent extremism, we have to be careful and we have to be very, very much um, aware that this is based on a very polarized understanding of security. Um, so you have the good ones and you have the bad guys. You have the terrorists and you have the, those who help to construct a, a prosperous democratic society. And I think this is a trap. And I think there, again, civil society, and we have to be very much awake, <laughs> that we really bring in again this message of diversity uh, into these analyses and into these analytical frameworks. Because I think if we don't do that, they bring us back to square one, and, uh, and that would be then uh, a big loss. Yeah. Maybe a, a last word on, 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 on Switzerland. So what we um, have been doing in the past uh, years, we have been monitoring this national, Swiss National Action Plan. What we decided now this year to do um, is also to have country studies, really independent civil society country studies exactly to share and to, to share the realities, to show these realities. So to have a kind of an alternative monitoring mode um, of the National Action Plan, um, and at the same time, and we are still struggling with, I would say, is the engagement with the security sector. Because what is easy, 
I say in brackets, easy is to engage with the development, the humanitarian, the peace building, the like-minded communities. But what is not so easy is to engage um, with the security sector in a sense, um, not that I would say they're all not like-minded at all, it's not the case, but because the security sector has a different logic and has a different, again, language, um, and also because we from civil society, I think we are sometimes very much reluctant uh, to really make an effort to engage there. Yeah. So that's still something that we are that we are looking at uh, for the next. So yeah. to influence also security policy and not only peace policy. Thank you. And um, maybe this is a question I would like um, also some of you to address. Have you been able to? get into security policy? Are you able to um, influence on that? Uh, maybe on both, both of you? What are the experiences? Did you get into these hard security policy issues as women and with a gender perspective? Um, a little bit, but not, not too much yet on the gender, but even civil society understanding the security sector so that was one project also started by Teresita Deles, um, civil, when she was still in civil society, um, studying and understanding the security sector. And now there is a network called